God Thanks. bless you. Thank you, Janet. Um, and I, I especially appreciated the songs tonight. You know, um, go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ has come. And the, um, that's kind of what I want to talk about in a way. Um, but <laughs> the topic, I, I have really struggled with this teaching and, and it, that doesn't happen for me very often. I, I have really, really struggled. And thanks to the wonderful love and support of Janet and Rhett, um, my brother, whom I've kind of talked this through with. And, um, you know, I just got so much encouragement. Yeah, speak it, you know, speak it out because it needs to be said. I want to talk about intolerance. <laughs> It's an emotional thing for me because what I'm hearing more and more and more is accusations against us, against Christians, that we're intolerant, that we're rigid. And it's, I'm hearing it especially from um, younger generation. You know, you, you, you're just so rigid on the truth. You know, why can't you just live and let live? And why do you have to be so intolerant? And I started thinking about that and I started asking myself the question, was Jesus intolerant? And I'm gonna tell you from my stand, my opinion, he was. I believe he absolutely was. And that's what I, what I wanna talk about tonight. He was intolerant of sin, he was intolerant of um, lies. He was intolerant of people following the devil. He was absolutely tolerant of hunger and thirst. He was absolutely tolerant of anyone who wanted to know, and he was welcoming of absolutely everyone. And we're going go to go go to the word and look at that. Um, you know, I... It's, it's interesting that um, this, this accusation of intolerance, what's, what's really happening is that, and you, all you have to do is watch the news for three seconds, right? And you, you see it in spades over and over and over again. What's in the spirit of inclusion, we're getting farther and farther from our standard of truth and farther and farther from who our heavenly father really is. And I'm gonna contend that the people who are screaming about tolerance are not at all tolerant. It's a lie. And we know that the devil is the father of lies. And the, you know, the, the big lie is, well, you, you know, truth is intolerant. But really what's going on is that we're, we're driving out the, the whole concept of sin. The concept of sin is becoming very unpopular to talk about. Um, and and what, what the lie behind it is that the people who are saying, um, you know, you're, you're being intolerant, are, what they're really saying is, um, <laughs> You know, the only thing we need to be intolerant about is um, telling someone that they're wrong or telling someone that, look, the truth says X. You know, it's, um, well, anyway, um, I think you get the, the idea of where I'm going to go with this. And I am charged up about it. And I apologize for being you know, emotional about it, but I think this is very, it's a very dear topic. And, um, you know, what we heard in the manifestations about, you know, God isn't bound by the way things look to us. And I think every one of us would agree, we're, we're looking at a country and a world where lawlessness is advancing more rapidly than we have ever seen it in our, in our lifetimes. And some of you may have heard me say this, that, you know, when I would read Matthew 24 and I would read that phrase, you know, lawlessness will increase, you know, in my heart, I'm thinking, 
Well, there's going to be more <laughs> bank robberies. There's going to be more car theft. There's going to be more jaywalking. You know, it never occurred to me until about a month ago that the lawlessness is coming from our lawmakers. It's coming from our court system. It's coming from the very people that we have in the past trusted to be lawful and, and to keep us safe. And it's, it's, it's eroding at, a, at, I mean, to say an alarming rate, I mean, it's such, such an understatement. It's, it's unbelievable, but um, anyway, so, and you know, there's tons and tons of examples in the news of hypocrisy and, and lawlessness and all that. Um, and, you know, I have examples of, um, well, I mentioned, you know, the younger generation, there's someone in, in my life who is that younger generation that I learned recently that one of her high school classmates is working in a, in a company that sells witchcraft paraphernalia. And, you know, I, I just mentioned it to her. I said, hey, your friend so-and-so, did you know, they're, they're um, in this company selling this, you know, stuff that witches use to do incantations and spells and stuff. And she, her answer to me was, well, I just think people ought to be able to pursue whatever they want. You know, and I, I, I wanted you to kind of think about, I've been thinking a lot about the phrases and um, like, what are, what are the catchphrases that we're hearing day in and day out that are letting us know about, you know, this, this erosion of truth and so forth. I mean, um, things like, you know, I've got my truth, you've got your truth. Don't judge me. Don't be judgmental of me. Um, you know, you go all the way back to the 60s. If, if it feels good, do it, right? That, that's an old one. Um, but here's one that I have found that I've heard from Christians twice in the last week that has really unsettled me. And that is, you know, in talking with fellow believers in my life about what I believe is, um, you know, uh, coming persecution or something like that, um, you know, and what do we do about that? Well, we just gotta love people. We gotta love people and we do. We do, and there's never anything wrong with loving people, but you know what I really heard? I'm just going to love people. I'm not gonna tell them about the name of Jesus because it might offend them. That's what I heard. And I know that's what was meant. And my plea for all of us, I mean, those of you ladies who have been in my women's fellowship, you know that I'm working on being bold this year. That's my thing, I wanna get bolder. Um, we all need to get bolder and we need to be um, free in our hearts to speak the name of Jesus Christ. Go tell it on the mountain and not worry about offending someone. And, you know, so we're, we're gonna go to the, we are gonna go to the Bible. <laughs> I'm gonna wrap up this introduction here in, in a minute, but, um, I really want you to think about that. You know, I, um, my husband's father, who lived to be 97 years old, had a friend that was a lifelong friend. These two people met in kindergarten, and Dave's dad lived to 97. This other guy, whose name was Jack, lived to 99. And the day I met Jack, he was in a nursing home, and um, Dave and I walked in you know, to, to visit him. And I wasn't in that room more than a minute and a half. And he looked at me and he said, do you know the Lord? And I, you know, big smile, of course, you know, I said, yes, but I know in my heart, he was fully prepared to tell me about him. If I had said what Lord, or, you know, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, whatever, you know, but imagine, I want that. I want that in my life. I want that kind of boldness and, and, and love. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't nasty, he wasn't angry, he didn't raise his voice. It was just very conversational. Do you know the Lord? I want that in my life. And I think that um, 
in, in these coming weeks and months um, in, in our country, in the United States, we're all gonna need that kind of boldness and that kind of love and to be that direct. Um, so, you know, we, we, you can go to Isaiah. No, let me just, you know this verse because I think it's come up in fellowships in the last couple of months fairly often, but Isaiah 520, you know, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, um, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. And again, I think all you have to do is watch news for, you know, 10 seconds and you'll see a lot of calling good evil and evil good. Um, it just, it seems to be all around us. And it was so comforting in Ellen's manifestation to hear that um, God is not bound by what we're surrounded with and what's facing us. Um, so let's go to Matthew. We're going to, we're going to go to Matthew uh, chapter. Um, hang on here. I got to roll my notes forward a little bit here. We're going to Matthew 11, and I wanted to look at a section of scripture that kind of paints in, in a handful, just a few verses, both sides of Jesus. So, you know, I think Jesus wasn't shy about offending people. <laughs> I think he wasn't shy about calling out sin. I think that he was absolutely loving and he was absolutely uncompromising. And this wonderful section of scripture in Matthew 11 puts both sides of him together in one, in one small section of verses. So we're starting in verse 20. It says, then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his mighty works were done because they didn't repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which were you know, two cities up on the Mediterranean coast that weren't really even part of Israel, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will go down to the grave. For if the mighty works had been done in Sodom that were done in you, it would have remained until this day. Now, I want to talk for a minute about Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum. And if you've been to Israel, you've on one of John's tours, you've undoubtedly gone to Capernaum. The last time we went to Israel, we went to Bethsaida and Chorazan. All three of these cities are utter ruins. In fact, Bethsaida is, is so ruined that there's a whole lot of controversy in the archaeological world about where it really is. I mean, there you can walk walk through it, you know, but there's a lot of excavation that hasn't been done. And some scholars say this can't be it. it it's it's got to be over that way a little bit or over that way. All three, all three of these cities, Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazan, are on the um, the northern uh, shore of the Sea of Galilee. And they're very close together. And you, you may be very familiar with the reality that Jesus, when he left Nazareth after opening his ministry, he headquartered himself in Capernaum. So here you have these three cities that are really, really super close together, and they're absolutely dead. And, and just catty corner across the, the lake, across the Sea of Galilee, is Tiberias which was also a city where Jesus 
you know, it, it existed during the time of Jesus and it, it became a Roman um, center, a, a capital, so to speak. Um, and it's a thriving <clears throat> city to this day. It's thriving, it's booming. But here, there you have Chorazin, Bethsaida and Capernaum, all of whom Jesus said, woe to you, and they're dead. They're absolutely dead right now. They, they don't even, you know, they don't even exist. So, you know, and what, what is woe to you? What is that phrase? That's not something that we um, use a lot, right, anymore. Well, um, to, to speak woe was to, you know, speak about some impending disaster or to speak about the coming retribution of God for unbelief or for, you know, could be a variety of reasons really. But so here he was saying, whoa, because of their unbelief, because of their rejection of him, because of their un unwill their stiff necked and hard hearted and unwilling to repent, unwilling to trust Jesus to believe to accept the miracles and yet these are the three cities where he did more more wonderful works than than any other and yet you know the the people still rejected and then he's so he and he look at it, it it'll be more tolerable in the day it, for Sodom are you kidding for Sodom in the day of judgment than for you so is that direct? I would say. Is it uncompromising? I would say. <laughs> is it calling out sin? I would say. I think it's inflexible and I think it's intolerant. But it was truth. Then he prays. And he said, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth that you hid these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to babes. And what he's really talking about there, if you scan back up to the you know, top of the chapter and even a couple chapters prior, he's teaching his disciples and he's, he's walking along and he's you know, got a whole group of disciples following him. And he's been explaining to them what the kingdom of heaven is like in parables. So he prays this beautiful prayer, thanking God that, that he hid these truths from the wise and understanding. And that's kind of, um, it's, an, uh, it's sort of like um, an aspersion about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, you know, the religious leaders and the people who had totally rejected him and, and so forth and revealed them to babes, meaning his 12 and all the disciples that were faithful to the hungry and the thirsty. And, um, and it may be, you know, revealed them to babes, meaning innocent in understanding, hungry and thirsty, but it also might be, you know, I read this wonderful article about the age of the, the apostles, the tw his 12. And it's, um, this article was contending that they were really, you know, like in their late teens and early twenties, it's it's believed that they were they were incredibly young people. So there you have this wonderful description of of the apostles and the disciples as babes, and then he says, "Yes, Father, because this was well pleasing in your sight." Then in verse twenty-seven. All things have been handed over to me by my father, and no one really knows the son except the father. Neither does anyone really know the father except the son and anyone to whom the son determines to reveal him. And it is kind of a confusing long verse. But what he's really saying is that it, there aren't very many people that got who he was and what he was about. There weren't people that understood the father because they didn't understand the son. And if they had known the, the, the son, they would have known the father and, and all of that. Um, so it's just kind of a, a way of Jesus expressing um, the reality that there were so few that like got it. <laughs> 
there were so few that were hungry and thirsty. Um, and the, the last phrase is a little bit challenging um, when he says, neither does anyone really know the father except the son and anyone to whom the son determines to reveal him. And you have to be careful with that because it does, what it doesn't mean is that Jesus picks and chooses who he's going to reveal himself to. He doesn't pick and choose who's going to be hungry and thirsty, right? The word determine really means more like um, desires, you know, that, that the son desires to anyone to whom the son desires to reveal himself. And we know that he desired to reveal himself to everyone. We know that because of the very next verse <laughs> that says, come to me all. All you who are laboring and have been loaded down with burdens and I will give you rest. And um, that again, it's sort of um, a veiled or not so veiled reference to the, the Pharisees who um, by their distortion of the Old Testament law uh, and, and the um, weighing the people down with ridiculous and burdensome traditions that were not part of God's heart that you know they they were loaded down they were in you know with, heavy with burden of imposed on them by the religious leaders of the time but he says come unto me all you who have been laboring been loaded down with burdens i will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me and what is the yoke that he's talking about. I mean, you've seen um, pictures of yokes, right? A yoke is, it's a very rigid, heavy thing that's put on like a team of uh, oxen. Usually that's kind of the typical image, right? Of, of a yoked pair, as a, a pair of oxen. It's uncomfortable. And the purpose of it was to keep them in line to, so that the furrows of the field would be, would be straight. Um, and so he's saying, take, take my yoke. And in scripture, the yoke is used figuratively um, to refer to a lot of things. I mean, um, the Old Testament law was referred to as a yoke. Um, the rabbinical traditions were referred to as a yoke. Um, in the early church writings, the, um, even the New Testament, the, the um, church epistles were referred to as a yoke. So what, you know, what are we talking about? Well, a yoke is something that um, helps you stay on the straight and narrow. A, a yoke is something that provides you boundaries, guardrails. That's maybe that's one that makes more cultural sense to us. We all know what guardrails are because we drive. They help us understand where the road is and stay on it, right? So that's what a yoke does. And so the, the yoke itself is not an evil um, <clears throat> or a burdensome thing. The yoke helps us understand how to obey. The yoke helps us understand how to conduct ourselves, how to live. And what Jesus is saying is take, take my yoke. You've been burdened by the religious leaders of the day. You've been lied to by the religious leaders of the day. They don't know me, but you know me. You are learning about me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am meek and humble in heart. He absolutely was meek and humble. And just a few verses earlier, he's saying, woe to you, Corazon. <laughs> it's a beautiful picture of contrast, isn't it? I mean, you know, everybody's welcome, but hey, my way. <laughs> you do it my way. Um, I am meek and humble in heart, and you will find rest um, for your souls. The yoke that Jesus was talking about, um, you know, when, when we obey the word, when, when we 
When we live in obedience, it lightens our hearts, doesn't it? You know, when we know, wow, I, you know, when you manifest in a, in a meeting or you pray, you know, it's a loving act. It's a wonderful, giving, loving act. It lightens the heart. It not only lightens your heart, but it lightens the heart of all the rest of us who are here listening, right? So, you know, I, take my yoke. Um, I am, you know, the burden is light. Trust, obedience, and all of that, it, it lightens the soul. And it's liberating. You know, there's there, there's nothing liberating. There was nothing liberating about the Pharisees. There's nothing liberating about the um, quote unquote inclusiveness of like, for example, what our Congress is doing. You know, we can't can't you can't say the new house rules, right? Can't say mother, father, son, daughter, sister, brother, any of those um, familial pronouns. Cannot say them in Congress anymore. Is that is that liberating? Is does that lighten your heart? You know, is it really inclusion? No, it's not inclusion at all. It's just you know we don't want you to have it your way. Um, anyway. You know, and I guess I'm, I'm kind of getting ready to wrap up here, but, you know, well, the net, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is kind and my burden is light. If you're reading in another version, you might see my yoke is easy. That's the King James. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. The yoke of obedience to Jesus, I don't think is so easy, but it's kind. It's gentle, it's nourishing, and my burden is light. You know, did I, when I was introducing all this, did I mention to you that in, in my thinking about this, it became apparent to me that one of the goals of the devil is to erase the idea of sin. Did I mention that? That so to like to call out, yeah, we just let's just get rid of it. Let's let's just make everything that's sinful okay. And so sin goes away. Then there's no disobedience. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> no, it's chaotic. Have you ever watched um, have you ever observed a family with toddlers that rule the house? It's not enjoyable. <laughs> It's, it's not enjoyable at all. Um, you know, the, the devil ruling the house is, is not an enjoyable thing. And we need to be, be bold to speak out, to, to tell on the mountain the name of Jesus Christ with all boldness and to take his yoke and to teach other people about the yoke because that yoke is kind, that yoke is is light and it lightens our hearts um it's it's unifying and it's glorifying to our precious heavenly father so that that is basically what i wanted to share